a dining hall, residential life offices, the mail room, bare necessities, student-run businesses. On WashU's current campus, they are all separate buildings. But from 1960 to 2009, all of these amenities were housed in one central building, the David P. Wool Center. This is the story of Wool Center, once the hub of the South 40. The story of the building begins with a vision laid out by former Chancellor Ethan Shepley, who wanted to improve WashU residential facilities to change the school from being a primarily commuter school to one where students would come and live on campus. With the purchase of the land to build the South 40, this dream would become a reality. It all started with the construction of four low-rise buildings to provide residential facilities for the students a central student center was constructed, the Wool Center, which opened in 1958. The building was named after David P. Wool, who was born in 1886 and started the Wool Shoe Company in 1916. Due to the wealth he amassed, he started the Wool Foundation in 1940, donating to many St. Louis institutions, including to Wash U, to help with the construction of the South 40. Unfortunately, Mr. Wool died on March 2nd, 1960, just under two months before the Wool Center was officially dedicated on April 29th. The building was located about where the Elliott Dorms and BD Courtyard are today. It was considered a shining example of mid-century modern architecture. Immediately, the building was liked by students with dining on the top floor and a sweeping outdoor balcony for students to enjoy. And students would literally be lined up around that outside rail and until it was their turn to, to sign up for their room for the next year. Students would hate the wait. At first, the bottom floor housed the mail room, offices, and meeting rooms. We would often say, hey, let's meet up by the mailboxes. And that was kind of the touchstone uh, point for uh, the beginning of afternoons and evenings. So the first thing you would do before going to dinner would be to check your mailbox, which was conveniently right next to the stairs to dining room D. In February 1963, the first renovations to the building were announced, including doubling space for dining on the top floor and adding a bakery, snack bar, game room, and more on the bottom floor. Through the 60s and 70s, Various events and gatherings were held in Wool. This showcased its importance as a student center. The upstairs, so we had our Uncle Joe's trainings and meetings up there frequently. They had walls you could pull and section off and make rooms. Our orientation would be in that space. The Res Life office was on the first floor. That's where a lot of uh, student clubs and activities were being spawned out of. At some point, the snack bar would be expanded to become the Bear's Den, which would serve grab-and-go food options. The Bear's Den was a grease pit. You grab something, quickly head off to campus. Right next to the Bear's Den, and we used to, uh, you know, it was kind of good and bad because you could just walk over there, and I found my love for bagels and cream cheese because the Bear's Den was right behind me. It was mostly garbagey fast food to get mozzarella sticks, mediocre pizza, toasted ravioli, you know, because we all need a, need that plus a soda at 1045 at night. There was a game room that had a couple pinball machines, actually. And that was, that was definitely a fun place to hang out and waste a lot of time. Bare Necessities and The Coop, a student-run convenience store, would also be featured. So The Coop was a student-run grocery store. It was always managed by students. It was small but it had everything that people needed and that was a good way to help put on your freshman fish team because it had you know, chips and oh, <laughs> candy and all sorts of stuff. In 1980 major renovations were planned for Wool's main dining options on the top level. Before the renovation there were four dining lines that all served the same food but had changing social status. 
there were four different lines, A, B, C, D, and I always ate in D. A and B were generally sort of assumed to be more fraternity and sorority or athletes. That's just how people sorted out. C and D tended to be the more um, cool place to hang out, and A and B were, was more to eat in quiet. With the renovation, two lines were kept conventional, while the other two were turned into exciting new dining concepts. One was the Red Eye, serving steaks, shrimp, and more, at prices ranging from $3.60 to $9. The other was the Flair of the Mediterranean, serving pizza and pasta in a nice dining environment. Students enjoyed the better food and service that came with the renovations, but felt the lines moved slower. Like any cafeteria, there would be fires, such as the one pictured here, from September 1983. It is unclear how long the red eye and flare of the Mediterranean lasted, but by the 1990s, these were no longer in service and the upper floor cafeteria only featured standard options, in addition to a salad place called Green Stuffs. It'd weigh how much you got. It, it would also drain your meal balance pretty quick. In 1992, an election party was held in Wool Center with news cameras present due to WashU having just held the October 1992 presidential debate. In October 1993, the former game room was transformed into a new lounge space called Ike's Place, named after beloved Wool Center night manager Ike Connor. He was the kindest, sweetest man. He was just well known to the students, and that's why he got a place named after him. The early 1990s saw a renovation of Wool, with the upstairs dining receiving the name Center Court. Students could walk through to different stations, including pizza, pasta, deli, traditional, and more. Center Court was sort of like a sit-down, kind of like dinner cafeteria kind of goes. I found the quality of food at Center Court to be lacking. A humongous seating area that probably was bigger than the current seating area that's up there now. We would eat as a whole floor of 50 people. It was definitely an experience that you couldn't replicate anywhere else. The last upgrade to the building came in September 2000 with the opening of a small fitness center on the second floor. We took a step to respond to the student interest in having a fitness center. Put some treadmills and electricals up there. Long rumored in wool were steam tunnels connecting it to Graham Chapel. Many were skeptical of the tunnel's existence. I, I, don't, I don't believe that. No, I, I never heard that. If you told me there were steam tunnels underneath the campus, I would say absolutely, but I never got to go in any of them. I've never been escorted to the steam tunnels, and uh, I have no knowledge. But some believed in them. I used to be able to tell where they are because if you watch the sidewalks when it snowed, you could tell where the steam tunnels were because that snow would go first. It find the entrance somewhere in Wall, and it would take you underneath, and you'd be able to go up to the Danforth campus through those steam tunnels. <laughs> I, I do know some people who had gone down in there, but I never ventured into them, so. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Chancellor Wrighton and Vice Chancellor of Students, Jim McLeod, led the effort to transform the South 40. McLeod's leadership and connection with students was pivotal to the success of the project. Jim McLeod was a visionary, and he was very experienced here at Washington University. We were working to a plan that Jim McLeod developed. However, while new dorms were built, Wool Center stayed stagnant. Center Court was proving to be unpopular to eat at, with an average of only 50 to 60 students eating there for dinner each night in 2005. The other issues with the building also became even more apparent, such as regarding the building's accessibility. Wool Center was the most horrible building you could ever imagine in terms of design. There's only one entrance into the building that didn't access it by stairs. You really have to know how Wool Center worked if you were in a wheelchair to get around. There was not much that we could do to dramatically redevelop Wall Center until we did it. Finally, enough funding was raised to replace Wool, leading to its demolition in summer of 2009, just past its 50th birthday. On the ground floor of Zetcher, we had dining in where the Res Life Office is currently. That was dining center while we were building out the new Bear's Den and that whole back end. 
an all-new, state-of-the-art dining facility, which would be the new Bear's Den in Zetcher House, replaced Wool Center. When Bear's Den finally opened in August 2010, students loved the clean design and improved food options. I believe that the new facilities were energizing to our team. The bakery is way bigger than it was in the old building. It's kind of small, like a little closet space. Other former wool facilities found new homes. This included Bare Necessities, which moved into the first floor of Umrath House, and the Fitness Center, which is now above the Bear's Den. We would say, somebody gave all this money to have their name on a building that people are like, oh, I've got to go to wool. It, it never felt like the, you know, the cool place to hang out. It was kind of the place you were forced to hang out. Because it was the hub for this of the South 40 in many, many ways. We saw a lot more students. Being at our office, being in there, there was students in our office all the time. We had a lot more student interaction through there than probably other places. You know, I enjoy working there. I enjoy the people that I can't crown it. Family. We were like a family. It really was a place to see and be seen. And you'd know all the employees who'd work there. They'd recognize you. It was the heart of, of my time on the South 40. It felt like home. I remember going there to meet with students had really great, wonderful experiences because of the students. We overcame all the challenges of Wall Center. Despite its rudimentary nature and myriad of changes, for just over 50 years, Wool Center played a meaningful role in students' lives. Stay tuned for more episodes of The Secret History of Wash U.